but don't they just go like, away. Poof, there it is. <laughs> I'm going to get started. As people come in, we'll just welcome them into the circle. But I feel like the time is very precious. And so my name is Henny Fitzpatrick, and um, part of the time I'm a biological physician. I started in the Marion Institute uh, a very long time ago, and it was really one of those times when it was a life-changing kind of event. Um, and that organization has taken a while. Uh, Sharon was with me, but she was a baby. Um, <laughs> she was really like a child. A child. <laughs> no, I'm no, but there are people in the core group, and it continues to grow. So biological medicine um, can include any kind of uh, any kind of way of improving your matrix. And 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 what it occurred to me uh, about this group through a conversation that I had about clowning that I do on the side is that um, we tend to be people who are um, overachievers in a very good way. We tend to, you know, work hard and think hard. And I think in general, all of us would agree that the world that we live in is not uh, very conducive to playing. And uh, in fact, why would we even have a topic about play at a biological regulatory medicine conference when what we need to, what we are also very interested in doing is knowing the remedies and knowing how to, um, how to, you know, treat this sort of a thing and treat that sort of a thing. But to me, we need tools in our toolbox for how to really loosen people up and how to get into parasympathetic, fun kind of activity. And so the way that this precious hour is going to go quickly is that we're going to um, is that we're going to play a little bit just because that will get us into that rhythm and we'll we just pay attention to how you feel as we play and then I have actually a handout and I'll talk briefly about um, taking a play history but to me that and then I'm going to put on my granny costume because I brought my clown it makes me <gasps> breathless and then if, if Yes, and then, uh, yes, I'll show you how she works. She, um, she's based on the idea that I was in a circus class, actually as kind of a therapy after things in my life had become post-traumatic and I didn't know that biological medicine was the next step. And so um, there was this clowning group called Wise Fool for women's clown workshops in the summer in Santa Fe, which is where I lived, and we did intensive work together. But really now it's become a kind of a women's empowerment thing. And so at some point we'll have clown workshops at these kinds of things because partner acrobatics and we probably won't be able to set up a tree, uh, trapeze, but partner acrobatics and clowning in the sense of identifying with your weaknesses and your fears and people will then connect because they recognize them is a really fun, um, is a really fun enterprise. And of course, always in these kinds of conferences, we want to make sure we have the tools to take home. And so play therapy is, um, just a wonderful tool and it looks like and we have a play therapist among us okay so it's a big circle so we're going to start by um we're going to start by by learning each other's names you can take your shoes off mine hurt me you don't have to take your shoes off but we're just going to throw the ball across the circle and we may divide into two circles because it's a big circle so you're going to look at somebody across the room you're going to say their name and throw it to them all you have to remember is who you received from and who you threw to. And, and then you'll see how very quickly we become a machine and then how we play. And there's no, nobody fusses. Everybody has to sit down if anybody doesn't catch the ball. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just sit down and be, that's the way our society works, but not really. So let's just see if it, how it goes. Our circle is a little bit big, but just throw to somebody and say their name and then that somebody discover someone else's name and it says their name. And just remember who you got it from and where you threw it to. Piper. That's a big circle. We can maybe move in a little because the throwing can get out of control. Yeah. You have to say the name. So Piper. Rose. 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 Sorry, didn't, didn't hear. Sorry. Um, what's your name? Barbara. Barbara. Chip. Caitlin. <laughs> Oh, Michael. <laughs> oh, oh, Michael. <laughs> Who is Dale? What'd you call me? I'm Dale. <laughs> oh, oh, that was a Michael. 
Michael. Who's got a name? I've got a name, but I've already been. Okay. Yeah, who, who hasn't been thrown? Who hasn't? We just have to finish up. <laughs> Dale hasn't. I have. All right, what's your name? I'm Sherry. Sherry. Michael. Dale. <laughs> and Jean. Jean. Okay. And then me. Okay. So I'm last, and I'm going to throw it to you. Okay. So now let's see how quickly we can go. And if you screw it up, that's okay. You're starting. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, okay. What's your name? Yeah. Here we go. Sorry. My name is Cheryl. Yeah. Cheryl. So Cheryl's just starting our ball. So this is how it went the first Rose. time. What? Barbara. Chip. Caitlin. Sharon. Maria. Angela. <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> Unbelievable. You guys must be <laughs> helping <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Sherry. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Jean. Did you get it? No. Penny. Oh, you're gonna Penny. you're gonna throw it to me and then and then I'll throw it. Penny, Larissa, and then back to Cheryl. Okay. Woo! Think we do too. I think we start another ball. Now, don't, don't forget who you threw to the first time. <laughs> this, is, this is just, your parasympathetic is just going, oh, it's, it's totally relaxing. It's just totally <laughs> relaxation. And then we'll have a mission you know, meditation. Who's <laughs> your parasympathetic? Start again, you just choose somebody different from who you threw to before, and the first ball will come from Michael to the <laughs> storm. Jeff. Jeff? Joseph. 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 Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. Uh, Joseph. Sherry. 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 Okay. Sherry. Um, Penny. Uh, I don't remember. Sorry, told me. Rose. Rose. Uh, Rose. Uh, um, Penny. Rose. Yeah. What's your name? Jean. 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 Christy. Christy. Oh, I caught it. <laughs> Piper. Barbara. What is your name? Sharon. Sharon. Dale. Angela. Uh, what is your name? Larissa. <laughs> 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 so who else hasn't had a second? We just need to know now where we are. So you're going to throw it to him. Just some people show. Yeah. Maria. Julie. Oh, 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 Caitlin. The pot. Cheryl and Michael each have a ball, and then we all of a sudden at the end, each ball receives to their person, and it's over. All right, so here we go. Piper. There we go. Chip. Rose. Barbara. Penny. Chip. Rose. Caitlin. Jean. Cheryl. How good. Christy. Maria. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Michael. I'm so close. <laughs> Changing. Okay. I, I forgot. That's all right. I'll throw it back to you. Because, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. to yeah. see yeah. what happens. Julie, keep the ball going. Uh, Sharon. <laughs> we're, we're all in. Damn. Damn. <laughs> all right. Angela. One. Oops. Sorry. Any catches for Angela? Spring training at the RMI. <laughs> This is, this is playing, and this is a quick, easy game to me because you do get to sort of know each other's names. But what's interesting to observe is, first of all, did you feel nervous? Because, like I said, when I put on my granny clown, I'm going to feel nervous. But isn't it interesting that, you know, that, our, that children are expert players? And that, that if you were doing this in a group of kids, you could watch a dynamic happen. Probably everybody would forget about 
who you throw to and why, and you just throw the ball around as though, because you don't ever want to say you don't remember when you're a little kid, so you just, you know, everybody all of a sudden, usually in groups, everybody in, in little kid groups picks up the fact that actually nobody can really remember the pattern. You're supposed to just remember, you know, who you come from and who you go to. And so if you just throw and say the names, eventually you know all the names. And so in a way it happened, but it's just good to observe because kids should be the expert players in the world. And um, there's a whole nother topic about how play deprivation has really become a huge issue in this country. And so tomorrow we're doing this sort of backwards. So tomorrow I'm gonna give the science of all of that and I, I will refrain a little bit from from getting into it, but the idea of play is that it is spontaneous and it is un, it's un, it's unlike sports or other things that you kind of do that are good for you because it, it has no purpose, which is very hard for uh, adult humans as well, but it's spontaneous and it's, it's group cooperation and if any of you or when any of you watch small children play, you know, it's chaotic, it's anarchic, it's incredibly, it serves an incredible purpose as, a, as an e, uh, evolutionary um, reality. And uh, there's all kinds of statistics about people that don't get to play. But it also often makes um, grown-ups uncomfortable. So if you see small children in rough and tumble play, there's a, there is some risk, there's some, sometimes a bloody nose, sometimes a hurt wrist, there's all these dynamics that are going on, but when we've done play studies, we really understand how absolutely important it is. You know, when, when we play, when we're really in a play activity, which is something that you lose track of the time with, um, the rules kind of establish themselves as they go. And it's interesting to watch at what age little children start yelling, not this is just an observation, start fussing at each other because they're not play, playing by the rules, whereas other, in other groups, there's just these spontaneous rules arising. And so these are all just qualities of play. And so we're gonna do a couple more things. How many of us are there? Let's count off. Yeah, we have a couple of extra pitches, I see. I know. Okay, so now you're going to have to come in. What we're going to do is, one at a time, we're going to make a web. And so there's no trick to this. But basically, people who have these, just take the um, rubber band off. And then, one at a time, so that there's not too much chaos, you're going to find one end of it and take it to the end of, the, of somebody. It doesn't have to be exact. But somebody's sort of across from you, because if you give it to that person, it's not much of a web. But basically, under your rubber band, just let this out. You can see that these were fine-tuned, made on, um, you know, by a special company. You can order web material, or you can tear up cotton and do this. That's another part of this, is it's so easy to play. Okay. So, Larissa, starting with you, just so we're not too disorganized, you're just going to take one, you're going to hold one end to give the other end to someone else, say their name, and then go back to your place. Yes. Okay, say your name, and then do the same thing. Jean. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Does it have to be, they don't have to have an empty hand, do they? Yes, they have to have an empty hand. So what we're trying to do here, come here. So what I'm okay. trying to do is to people go. So you, I have, I just have one. It's all right, just go across. Oh, you have a short one. <laughs> I knew there was, yeah, I think we're recently used at a little school where the kids, yeah, there. okay, this is a short one. All right, so all the idea is to let's just build a web and then you do want to kind of go over under. So now on the people that already have webs, there you go. There you go, okay, go ahead. Say your name, please. You will have to come in closer to it. Yeah, we can do it either orally or just orally, but I'm used to doing it with eight year olds and then you tell them to do it all at once. It just feels great. And if you need some new, I have some extra ones here. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Let's see, anywhere back here. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I guess they So originally, this was an exercise. Does anybody know any of the work by Joanna Macy, who is a wonderful? Who is a I'm wonderful, so sorry. Um, she's a wonderful 
was a wonderful mentor of mine who was a who was very big into ecology. And in fact, when we didn't understand that there wasn't a web well of life, she suggested we do this with everybody representing a species. Yeah. Okay, I'm going for you. No, no, no. No, here is. I have more. Oh, yeah. I see. Oh, how about she get I got it. I thought we were. Let's we make it crazy. This is great. <laughs> see, already. But don't. This is if you were a kid. <laughs> if you were a certain kind of kid, you would just lie down and ask everybody to pick you up. Or you would. So this is the kind of way that I would like you guys to think. Want to. It would not have an end. And it, does anybody feel like they really? Yeah, go ahead. Like, straight across, even if no, you're wearing an outfit for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yay. 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 So now, what's fun about a web is can we hold it completely still? This is just exercises. You the lightest person on Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then when you're, doing it with kids, when you're doing it with kids, you can explain that if you do something, this is actually a good way of explaining the matrix, too, that if you, that if you give a little bit of magnesium or take a little bit of magnesium away, not only does the calcium wiggle, or whatever it is, but also the whole web wiggles. And so this is good. And then you can play by going up underneath it and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then... I'm going to step back, and the next thing is how are we going to untangle it? Because we're a little pressed for time. So you guys get to decide how you're going to untangle it and get everybody one back. Everybody one person let go. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 That's it. And so just one more and then I'll sit down and talk about play. Another system Another thing, so everybody just take one dowel. It makes no difference what length. Now we're gonna make rhythm. That's another thing that you need. Just take one to begin with. And then I have other I don't know, let's see how many we have left. So you wanna have two yes. You wanna have two of one you want to have two of some kind, so if you have one bar here, take that, take this. Go ahead, you don't have to wait to so guess what we're going to do. under one leg. is pressure and so I want to make sure that you all have the idea that if you ever initiate any kind of things like this in any community that you have but especially with people who you feel in your work in any kind of biological medicine need to be unleashed and you tell a grown-up to play they usually feel like you've told them one more thing they're doing wrong but if you hand them a couple of sticks and just make noise like we just did it really um, gives them the idea that anything can become play, and we'll have more about that later. But now what we're going to do is say our name and do a rhythm, and we're going to pass that around. But this way, we'll go one person at a time. So you can have a three or four beat rhythm. And so if I gave you one, two, three, that's pretty easy. And you repeat mine. Say my name, Henny. So Henny, one, two, three. Henny, one, two, three. And then make up your own and pass 
past just yours, so we leave mine, then we'll see if we remember all of them. Okay, here's one. Good. <laughs> Angela. Hi, Bert. Chip. <laughs> so, so you can, if, you, if it helps you, you can say dot, 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 dot. This isn't to show who's a bad rhythm person. I am. I am. <laughs> if you were little kids, you'd be, you know, so I'm trying to in, in, uh, encourage you to just figure it out. So this was dot, 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 dot. It's like shaving a haircut two bits. That's the very olden days. But um, just do it so that you help each other. It's not to put the pressure on you and say, oh, you got the rhythm. Um, Does everybody remember the sound they made? No, I don't know. You did. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I don't have to remember. But why don't we just pass a one, two, three, four around as quickly as we can? So it'll be, let's just practice it. One, two, three, four. same time. So let's count off by um, fours. This will make you all laugh. One, two, three, four, one, or five. Just one, one two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We're going to sing um, 
the lion in the jungle, you know, da 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 We're gonna do it with rhythm and we're gonna make a whole concert. We might do this at the conference tomorrow when I give my show, but you know, <laughs> people are frowning, but you guys will know your role. So um, <laughs> the ones raise your hand. All right. So you're gonna go ball, 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 and this is the bass, okay? All my ones together, our role is ball ball bum. Okay, so everybody can do that. We'll learn the one part in case the ones need help. So this is number one. Now the twos are. We can say a wee ma wet. A wee ma wet, a wee ma wet. Do your rhythm however you want. A wee ma wet, 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 a wee Come on. Ta -da -da. Three. We can make it prettier. Three. Gather up into two. All right. Let's do one. All right. We got two. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh gosh, all right. That was really fun, you guys. So that was I was going to just show you how to do, I'll put ground me on at the very end. But I let's sit, we can now sit maybe in a circle here. You can bring chairs up. I have handouts. I didn't know how many to make, but we'll share, and then they'll be on the website about how to take a play history and how to pull this all together for your practice or your community. I think we did a PRMI tour bus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 PRMI ringtone. Yes! No <laughs> great! The other thing. One piece of information that's really good is if you ever have a teenager or even an adult or somebody that's trying to express themselves, this used to work. I have two sons and three daughters, and my daughters sort of could tell me what was on their mind when they were in high school. But my one son absolutely was tongue tied and he was annoyed about we may need to um, give every other one, we're going to run out because I was only going to have a small number of people. I'm so glad you guys came. Um, but one of the things to remember is that if you're trying to get difficult information, especially out, out of a male person who's less than 21, give them a ball to play with or toss with them. So truly, I was at my wit's end because family was going through a lot of transitions. Mom had become a biological doctor, and um, it wreaked some havoc. And uh, you know, when, if I stood and played ba basketball with him, then he would tell me stuff. But the minute we stopped, he wouldn't. And so you reminded me of that. That if you're Literally, you know, something to fiddle with actually, especially seems like for young adolescent boys, is to just give them something to do. So if you're in any kind of a therapeutic situation or just getting a history and people are sort of tightly answering, it sometimes helps to just stand up in the room and play catch. It's not about the catch. And then, of course, if they're all upset that they can't catch, then you've maybe made more trouble, but it's good to blow it off. But also, let's, before we go on to this, let's take a minute to just see how you feel. Everybody feels exhilarated. So your right brain, your parasympathetic nervous system is um, on. And I hurried us, and we didn't give, give each other enough time to really learn all of it. But that was just because it was a quick demonstration, and we only had an hour. But play deprivation is really a problem. I'm going to give all the science tomorrow. But there's a really wonderful uh, man named Stuart Brown. And like I said, you don't have to write anything, this will all be there, but this is his little book called Play. And this is just a gem of a book. And he was somebody that in the 60s decided that we really needed, you'll understand better tomorrow why. But there was um, a reason to understand that the play deprivation that is going on now, and Michael was just saying, it's two things. One of them is that we are way over scheduled. And so we know that all of our children are scheduled, even in preschool they're scheduled meaning that you know you have this time and that time and how many people that work with children know that that transition just make I mean it's hard for us to transition to so, you know I was just getting my rhythm and now I got to put on my shoes and go so that's one of the things that 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 free time thoughtless meaning left brain thoughtless empty time with no purpose is very 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 important to us and I think none of us can claim that we do that very often Daydreaming is really, really serves a function. And so, um, again, tomorrow we'll have an hour to give all of the, the network of what I'm already saying. But one of the things you can do is to get into this kind of a play history. And for yourself and for your other people is to, first of all, figure out how much play deprivation you had. Starting in about the 1960s, our time became very, very precious. And so wasting time was really, I certainly grew up in a house where wasting time not looked um, kindly upon and um, you know that just kind of laying around doing nothing still may worry if you have a small child in your midst and the child just stays around lays around doing nothing maybe it's okay when they're four but when they're 12 they're not supposed to do that but there is a real physiology to this and I'm not saying <laughs> that it's all or nothing it's not irresponsibility but it is it really is a physiological purpose. And so the next time you get a chance to walk by a playground or to go into a preschool or if you still have small kids or if you have any, any opportunity to watch them, it's amazing to watch little children play, either an imaginative play or rough and tumble play or some of the other ones listed here. But I'm going to give us some stark statistics, which is that, um, a, you know, in this business of, of autism, ADD, learning disability, being on the spectrum, 
or even just being irritable. I'm right now working with a um, really wonderful, I'm working with pediatrics and it's a basically a wellness care kind of a model, but there's a lot of children who are already showing signs of stress from the time they're three or four. But back in the olden days, autism was a disease that was clear at birth often. So I trained in the 19, I graduated, I'm sorry to say, I'm gonna be 63 in three days. That's how old I am, it's just how, you know, I can tell you what I weigh too, and then we'll know everything <laughs> about me. Um, but people don't say their age. But so I, you know, I was in medical school in the 1980s, and at that point, autism was a very unusual illness that was kind of lumped in with, with, um, some sort of a birth trauma or a genetic trauma. It was sort of something that was a developmental delay from birth. And now we have this new phenomenon where kids at the age, between the ages of 18 months and two, start losing skills. Has anybody ever worked with a kid like that or known? I mean, this is terrifying. You have a totally normal, it's terrible. It's difficult enough if you have a birth injury or a genetic anomaly or a, something that is different at birth. It's, it, but it's something totally different if you have a perfectly normal toddler who is you know, talking and saying their words and walking around and over the course of three or four weeks, it just disappears. And so the incidence of that is, was, when I, so the incidence of autism at all in 1980 was one in 5,000. In 1997, it was one in 500. And now for boys, it's one in 42. And so, when we talk about these toxins and when we talk about um, all the other things, the diet and the stress and all of that, that's a call to action to me. And the reason that I thought, well, anyway, I'll just give a workshop about play is first of all, because it's fun, but it's also that this is something that everybody can do just as a way of life and to, to remember that, that we really need to de-stress our world. And so get some sticks. These are, you know, you really can order rhythm sticks off the internet, but you could also get dowels at Michael's and cut them. <laughs> or go into a wood pile, which is the other thing I was doing, is that I was doing some woodworking and I just picked up all the scraps, thought, oh, workshop, let's get some instruments going here. But, but anyway, so um, again, I'll go into the statistics a little bit more, but playing is very important. So what play is, it's spontaneous, joyful, and cooperative. And the benefits of play, which should occur throughout all of your, your entire life. There's no rule that play should stop at the age of 20 or 21. Um, but what, what people who play have is it decreases aggression, it increases resilience, it increases stress tolerance, it cultivates empathy, and it decreases bullying. And so when you see little children in rough, rough and tumble play, they're often kind of rough on each other when they're diving and hitting and biting and yelling and you know doing all of that. But often, they, if you're the adult, I'll talk about risk aversion tomorrow as well, but if you're the adult, it's hard to watch, but if you're the kid, they're doing what they need to do. And what you, one of the beautiful things that Michael uh, um, Stuart Brown says is that if you watch children play, you can understand what their talents are. Because in a small group of children who are playing, somebody's clever, somebody's quick, somebody hits too hard and gets kind of told that was a little too hard. They, they just do this in their social play and somebody doesn't hit hard enough and learns, well, I can see what happens if, but in one way of, this all came from animal studies, but in one way of understanding it, it's really important to, um, to um, observe kids and sort of see who they're becoming. What a wonderful idea. And so if you're stuck or somebody that you know is stuck, then do some playing and the way that you play may actually unleash some of this because that's kind of how we're wired. And so, um, like I said, I'll talk more about it. But this is a good way to take a play history. And so I'm gonna read through this because the, um, because we won't have time to do it. I was hoping that we would have like a two hour workshop time and that we could get into small groups and take each other's play history. But let me go through and then you can, if you don't, I can make copies. I just didn't want to do slides in the slide projector in this, in this context. And so the first part of it is that there's several different kinds of play. So the ones in color, make-believe play means um, fantasy play. So each of you, who here, um, I mean, if you were, so play deprivation, if you were born, if you're in your 50s or 60s, anybody else in their 50s or 60s, I, I don't care how old you are, 
but did, did you have, did you guys feel like you had an opportunity to go outside and just play until they rang the bell and you came whistle. in at night? Yeah, the whistle, <laughs> yes. Until it's it got dark. dark. And so of the rest of you, I mean, I don't care how old you are, I mean, how many of you had the opportunity, this is more about neighborhoods and more about the complexity of a world, to just go outside and play? Now, the age of 14, if you ask regular parents whether they will let their kids go outside and play unsupervised, it's the age is 14. So, and if you never got a chance to do that, you guys are fine. I'm not saying that, but I mean, it's just, it's, things have really, have really changed because often when you get people to remember, like, what kind of rough and tumble play did you do between zero and seven? And a lot of people, after seven, you didn't really play much anymore. I think those of us who are a little older, we continued to play because there wasn't anything else to do. It required a carpool, and, you know, we didn't, we just, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. So again, did you do make-believe play between 12 or 18 or um, in college? And if you were an actor, yes, you probably did. But if you played some of those games like, um, what did the boys play when we were in college? Yes. Demons and Dragons, sorry, say them out, yeah. Dungeons. Dungeons. <laughs> I was never into it, but, but you know. And so, so that's what imaginative play is, but make-believe play, and it's also just Believing, and so down below when you look at some other things. But get your get do this for yourself, and also do it for other people. But how many of you um, continued rough and tumble play till you were 18? It's I'm just asking so that you're yeah. And how many continue to do so? Sexual play it comes to mind, and that's another thing. But we're we're that's a different kind of a thing. That's usually in an intimate partnership, and that's very important too, but if the only creative play or rough and tumble play you have is in that context, we're not talking about that because I'm talking about expanding your idea of play to much bigger. So I, it just comes to mind. Um, and on that, never mind, I won't say anything about that. Um, so um, <laughs> object play is blocks and Legos and that sort of thing. Do any of you play with Legos? Good, but in your work for one thing, but yeah, yeah. But you know, there's a lot of adults who, who play with Legos. There's also all kinds of meetup groups if you want to start any of this, that's good. And then artistic play. How many of you have artistic uh, time once a week? Tell me what, just to say it out loud. Drawing, good. Let's draw. Good. 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 Theater, music. 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 music, dancing, coloring, you guys, yeah, I almost brought my color. But these are things to add in. This is really good for your health. I think that the same as changing your diet and trying to have non-stress time. I, I, I would also say that if you if you get yourself to the gym to exercise, that's different. So why is that different? Structured. Yes, and it's not not goal oriented. <laughs> you know, it's like you want to go faster. I, I definitely work out, but they, they they make the he makes the comment that if you go out and play tennis just to play tennis, but often if you're a tennis player as an adult. You go out so that you can, or golf, or any of those things, you go out and you want to win. And that's okay, but the point of this kind of play is to be more spontaneous and to lose track of the time. Okay, so we won't have time to do each other, but um, what did you and your family do for fun? And also, how often did you see your parents having fun? I don't remember ever seeing my parents have fun. Okay. In fact, I mean, I don't remember really seeing them laugh much. They weren't very nice. I don't mean they weren't nice. They're very hardworking. But that kind of joy is really something that if you bring that up to people who are not feeling well, it can be as effective. You have to work at it a little bit and you have to provide some understanding. But it physiologically, like which I'll talk about tomorrow, physiologically things really lighten up if you can just laugh. It's just not so easy to do. And if you can model that to small children, it's very, very good. So um, another kinds of questions are, when have you felt free to do and be as you choose? Um, and do you have a sense of personal freedom in your life now and in the past? And you know, this, is, this starts to feel really serious. <laughs> and so, because I think a lot of us don't feel free. And I think that the, the, it's not, the idea isn't that you become, that Dr. Henney said you can just become irresponsible and it's really time for me to play for a year, everybody. It's not that, it's that we have to have a blend of things. And if you can let yourself off the hook, sometimes you can restore the sense of something that's missing. I would also say, and I'll play, I'll, I'll talk about this 
um, a little bit more tomorrow, but we've said that there's play deprivation, and we've said that if you don't play as a child, you are actually a tendency to be less, much more rigid and much more of a bully. But to me, what's happening in adults now is that there is a lot of rigidity, and there is a lot of more awful things than that, a lot of lack of tolerance, a lot of um, lack of resilience. And so when I'm talking about playing, I'm talking about how all the people that we come across are stuck in those ways. And we, our society expects parent, I mean people, human beings, to be stuck in their ways. But we're saying here, as part of the matrix, just as all the other things that we're doing for the matrix um, hold, is that if you can start to play again like a little child did, or um, at least experiment with the kind of stuff we just did, get some sticks and mark around, march around your house, um, you know, it'll make a huge difference. So in a way, it's very simple, and it seems kind of maybe silly and useless, but to me, the, the amount of violence in the world may be directly related, the amount of violence and attention deficit autistic spectrum is, of course, from all the different inputs, but part of it is because of play deprivation, but I don't see that changing. So. I just think it's very interesting to think about. What do you do regularly that creates and feeds your life force? What did you do in, what do you do in your life that engages you fully and effort, effortlessly? Dr. Um, Dr. Tom this morning was talking about asking people what do you do for fun? If you have any, if you're in your context of whatever kind of medicine you practice, always ask people what you do for fun. I ask six year olds and most of them can spot spurt something out, but when I ask an eight or a 12 year old, a lot of them can't think of anything. And I don't even care what they say, it's whether they can think of something. So if I say to you, what do you do for fun? You're like, you know, then, then, then maybe you need to, to do something more fun. And he said you should get back up out of bed and do something fun. Yeah. That may be a little hard, but yeah. What would that be? I don't know. And so it's about creativity and feeding your life force. What do you, what, what does, what describes you when you and when you are at your very best? I, I always have a question on my uh, intake. You know, these intakes get extensive. But to have people list their strengths, and I always put don't be shy, it's really interesting because people, you know, your peers probably tell you you have strength, strengths, but to write them down, you know, what are you passionate about? It, it, it's it's interesting to just have people to write it down. Not that it has, not that you're going to necessarily do anything about it, but just to see if people can think of that. What have been the impediments to play in your life? Talk about what those are tomorrow. And list activities that you do where you are fully present and can lose track of the time. And so one of the errors of today's one hour is that we couldn't lose track of the time, and that was my fault because I feel you're we would be standing here throwing this ball and I'd say, okay, workshop's over. And you guys would feel like, well, we could have done that, you know, on our own time. But um, do think of just a little bit of timelessness every day. So think about when you were a kid, what did you do where you lost track of the time? Let's just go around if you can think of anything or skip or just say it out. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Go ahead. Bike riding. Bike riding. Uh, that brings up a good one. So if you guys Ride bikes. Oh, We've squeezed Granny out. Maybe we're at lunch quickly. So riding bikes is a good thing. But you remember how you rode a bike? Because Stuart Brown, who's in his 80s now, and started this International Institute of Play. It's a fascinating thing. That'll all be written down tomorrow. There really is a substantive filling in of what I'm saying today. We just had to do it in the reverse order. But he talks about riding his bike. 100 miles an hour up a hill over the bumps. And so one of the things, if you are a commuter on your bicycle, go to a parking lot, I discovered this recently, with your bike, you don't want anybody to be watching, and ride like you used to when you were a kid. Ride up and ride between things and like just go this way and this way and steer. You know, when you were a kid, you you did weird, you know, wild things on your bike. You didn't just you didn't just commute down the path. And so if you are commuting down the path and you feel like you're in a joyful mood, you might spread the love by just zipping around somebody or just driving, you know, I do it every now and then where I'm just, you know, not not to run anybody over, but it's that kind of play. So not only might you ride your bike, but but ride your bike like you did when you were a little kid, you know, down into the hollow and up. You're probably going to scrape your knees. Hopefully you won't break your wrist. Call me if you do. I'll get the cast for you. <laughs> but I'm saying that, you know, kids do 
you know, part of it is you knock out teeth and stuff. But I just think bike riding is a good, a good example of that. So if you're running, then do a couple skips and hops. Okay. What else do people do that lose track of the time? Playing in a treehouse. Yes. Yeah. That was for me. It was just up in a tree and just. Yeah, it brings. Yeah, two tall trees in the back of our house, and I would. It's actually very dangerous. If I can focus on what I was doing, it was like so dangerous what I did. But I'd climb up this. It was 100, over 100 feet tall, and I had to, and I was not that tall, and I would have to stretch and, and actually pull myself. Oh, if I slipped, I would have killed myself. So it was very dangerous. But I did that all the time, and I just get up there, and sometimes an hour or two would pass. And you just remember and I just, that to this well, I go day. and watch clouds, you know. And think of things, you know, think of or watch neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's lunchtime, and I, I'm not supposed to not have lunch. But I, I wanted to just plant a seed. Um, I mean, not let you all have lunch. That's not it. I wanted to plant a seed, and I know we had to rush. But to me, the, the, the combination of just having a quick workshop is better than not having a workshop. And tomorrow, um, at the end of the day, we'll fill in some of the science of this. And then, hopefully, you'll have a tool. And um, I suggest you just figure out ways to play. You want to play.